And today's talk and workshop is going to be called Understanding the Problem. What we'll learn in the workshop today is how to develop a great problem statement. We're going to build knowledge about the end users who have the particular problem that you're trying to solve so you can create the right solution for the right customer. I'd like you to have a paper and pen or pencil available so we can do an exercise and we'll do Q&A at the end and you can add your questions into the chat. I'm Karen Donahue. I founded my own user experience design practice oh, sometime around 1997, have been in a couple of startups, <clears throat> have started a couple of startups, and I've also developed a an app called Local Haze. It's a air quality monitoring app for iPhone. It monitors just under 30,000 sensors worldwide over six continents. And it's designed to be really easy for people to use to understand their local air quality. I've had a really long career in technology, mostly in product design, UX design. And I'm the author of two business books on UX. You can see the one on the right that I just finished. It's specifically um, focused on user experience for founders and newly minted product owners and product managers. And I'm also, in addition to a Tufts alum, I'm an MIT Media Lab grad. So what do I do? I ship products. I design them, I build them, and I ship them. Uh, here's just a sampling of some of the products that I've designed. Some of them have been really successful in the market. So that's the Razer 2 phone there that you can see, the clamshell phone. Some of them have not been successful because of lots of uh, complications or market conditions, but worked on software platforms. So on the left is the Savage phone. This is the Misolo keyboard, which is a two octave wireless keyboard designed for iPad. This is actually a robot for stroke patients uh, to enable strokes patients and their therapists to engage in therapy. This is a wireless picture frame from Kodak using the frame channel service. And this is what I'm doing now, which is local haze. So I'll show you some of that. I, my career, I started as a computer scientist. I started at Tufts. I got my bachelor's in computer science, and then I focused on pen-based computing, and then went to the Media Lab uh, at MIT, and then have been involved as a either a VC-backed co-founder or early employee or a practitioner ever since then. Most it just focused on user experience practice and entrepreneurship. What do I think of when I think about designing products? It's really a balance between interests. Those interests are the interests of the business the interests and the needs of end users and the constraints of technology. And as a user experience practitioner, my role is to envision a product from the point of view of the end user. And that can also be a buyer. I'll show you that later on when we look at personas. And I practice user-centered design, or sometimes you'll hear this called design thinking in a business context. And as a practitioner, you're either designing new products or improving existing ones, ones that are fielded or having trouble in the market. So user experience is at the intersection of all those areas. It's a really exciting area to be and constantly evolving. So we're gonna talk about problem statement. That is understanding what problem does your product solve? Being very, very clear and intentional. The reason I say that is because products can unfortunately mistarget the market. On the right is the Juicero. If you don't know what that is, you should Google it and look up the history of that product. You could end up with a product where the target market is really poorly understood. You can misunderstand your user's needs. You can mistime the market. You can not be looking at a, a problem that has a value to extract, et cetera. And you can also sometimes develop a solution to a non-problem. Okay, so the value of writing a really well written problem statement is that you clearly identify the problem you're solving and not the solution. The biggest issue I see is that people tend to put the solution in the problem statement. And it also is a form of communication. It communicates the desired conditions that you want to get to as a vision for your product. And it's really useful for communicating as a device for communicating to stakeholders and your team members because you may not be building your product alone. You'll be working with a team and the problem statement helps everybody understand the goal and the vision of where you're going. So the format of a problem statement is in general, you state the user or the, what we call the persona, the user person you're, you're gonna be serving is with your product, the need, and then you state the compelling reason. So generally this format, it doesn't have to be exactly this format, but for today, we're gonna to look at this format. And you really need to be able to articulate why your product is important. 
Why is it compelling? Does it solve a user problem, pain points? Does it solve a particular gap in the market? Why, why do people care why it's important? I'm gonna look at an example from Local Haze. I just wanna show you some context for why Local Haze was an important problem to solve. If you've ever heard of PM 2.5, which is particulate matter, it's very, very small pollution particles. In fact, they're so small that four PM 2.5 particles can fit on one of these blue circles, and then five of those blue circles can fit in the width of a human hair. So very, very tiny. And the reason there it's important is particles that are smaller than 2.5 micrometers can get really deep into your lungs. Even very fine particles can get further into your respiratory system. It's a big problem, especially for people who may have asthma or other conditions. So an example problem statement that when I set out to design that product, here's the statement. Consumers need to be able to easily monitor the level of local air PM 2.5 because it poses a health risk. Okay, so following our syntax, there's the, the user, the persona, statement of the need, and the reason. It's com a compelling, impactful reason. So I'd, li I'd like you to just be mindful of this as you're starting to think up some practice problem statements that we're going to work on. You want to be able to articulate it this way. A poor problem statement, if we look back at what we just looked at, and a poor problem statement would have, uh, like for example, it would state too much of the solution in the statement. So for example, everyone needs an app to see face icons that use color, et cetera. That's the solution, that's not the problem, okay? So you really need to understand that when you are thinking about the problem statement, it's about stating the problem, preferably succinctly, and, then, and, and stating the current conditions and the goal state you wanna get to. The problem statement then helps you to articulate the use case. The use case is a particular scenario that describes how a user solves a problem to achieve some value. So an example of local haze is that the use case is, I'm solving a problem where the consumer needs to understand the answer to the question, is it okay for me in, in terms of air quality to go outside for a walk today? Your solution, or your product offering is gonna enable or optimize the solution to the use case. So be thinking about your problem statement and the use case and then the solution. It kind of flows in this order. So for local haze, there's the problem statement, the use case in the middle, which describes the user solving the problem. The user actually now has to go outside, maybe put a coat on, open the door, step outside, look for smog or haze or, or um, any smoke and smell for smoke. And then um, the solution to that is actually having something you can hold in your hand and just very quickly tap and see if it's okay to go outside. That's what local haze does. It, it's a user experience that allows consumers, you don't have to be an air quality expert. You don't have to be a scientist. You can easily understand whether the air quality is good or whether it's okay or bad in any location or your location where you happen to be. So that's how we flow the problem statement through to the use case and the solution. So some tips when you're starting to write your problem statement, don't include the solution, that's number one. And you need to really clearly understand the problem you're solving and for whom. I've been involved in ventures where the teams, the founding teams did not understand the problem they were solving. They jumped so quickly to the solution without thinking through for whom is this a problem? Where are the pain points? Can we identify those pain points and really dig in and understand motivations and how we're gonna solve them and, and really understanding the value, why it's important or impactful. How is this going to create value with the solution? So when we talk about personas that I mentioned earlier, it's really about answering who is the end user of your product. So with Local Haze, the end users are consumers, that are often technical citizen scientists. They're people who care about monitoring the quality of their air. This is an example of a template of a persona. You can download a free copy on my website if you like. And what it is, is it shows how, from my point of view as a seasoned practitioner, the depth to which I wanna understand my personas. And this is a primary persona. This is the, the, the highest primary persona for the product. And you can see it includes demographics up here. I like to have 
the examples of quotes, I like to understand their affiliations and their characteristics. Are they very technical? Are they sort of middle of the road? Are they non-technical? Do they have affiliations to particular brands, which sort of sets their expectations of what they expect in a product experience and also the service part of that around that? What are their frustrations and pain points? So in this case, this is a, a user who's really concerned about local air quality and maybe has a family member with asthma. So there's the pain point, right? Can't find the right sensor to buy, is really concerned about being able to monitor and understand that local air quality conditions, those PM 2.5 values. They have a particular point of view, which is they read scientific reports. They want to understand the air quality and they will even go to build their own hardware as required. So this is a very, very motivated persona. They have specific questions like, how do I know that the air quality readings are accurate? What's, how do I trust it? Why should I trust it? How many sensors are located all over the world and where are they? And they really are using very um, modern technology. So this is not a user who's using an old uh, version of a phone or you know they're, they're staying up to date on some of the technology that you think you're gonna deliver uh, for your product. So you wanna understand these attributes and then um, go out and perform research so that you validate your uh, assumption. So the persona is really an end user model. It's a sort of, you think of it as an empty, empty template and you have to go in and fill in this template by filling in and, and also validating your assumptions. So you may have assumptions. I call those the hypothesis. The hypothesis might be that, you know, you think it's your opinion or your assumption that your user wants to be able to access this in a way that is um, accessible on a particular device. That's a hypothesis. You need to go out and test that. So you need to do user research to validate your personas. This is before you even settled on who your target user is. You need to prove or disprove, and it's okay to disprove. It's, it's better to find out earlier that you're targeting the wrong user with your solution than when you've already built the product and it's in, in the sales uh, cycle. So you wanna pr prove or disprove through interviews with people. Um, here's me interviewing someone about a, a experience in, I think it was South Station. Oh, on the lower right, I'm in South Station. It's winter, you can see I'm wearing a coat because it's cold there. Um, and then in this one, I'm interviewing in a bank, in a lobby of a bank, just before the security guards threw us out, actually. So I'm kind of, it was like a roving user experience researcher, but going all over the city, interviewing people. And I think you have to be willing to do that to get the data to prove or disprove your assumptions about your personas. An example user research interview would be asking open-ended questions. Clearly now with COVID, you're not necessarily meeting face-to-face, -face. you can do it online. But um, in general, the guidelines are use open-end questions. Don't answer the questions for the user. Now, there are probably people on this call, Chauncey Wilson's a great one to ask, you know, people who have a lot more opinions and advice about how to do great user research. And in general, I think they would recommend that you need to be able to be a great listener. Do not talk over your, uh, your interviewees. Do not shape their answers. And you really need to be prepared. I, I like to write out a script for the interview. So at least I have an idea of the things that I wanna cover and some of the data that I wanna gather from the interviews. I also recommend that you write down your hypotheses or assumptions so that you can look at them later on and, and say, you know what, I prove that it's true or I disprove this. So we're gonna look at an example now of a user experience uh, interview. This is gonna be for Elaine. Elaine is a consumer who owns a fitness tracker. And uh, we're gonna first answer some basic demographic information. So Elaine is on the call. Elaine, you're there? Yes, um, okay. am I getting in character now or? You are in character okay, now. I, in character, uh, so I, I gotta like kind of like get okay. it. Okay. Um, I'm now in character. Yes. Okay, she's, she, so you can see she's in character. Her, she's a fitness enthusiast. And so I would ask her, a few questions to start. I'd ask her name, I'd ask her age group. If you don't feel comfortable asking people their age, and sometimes people don't wanna tell you, you can just give a sort of a guideline or a group of age, uh, age group. 
and may, maybe their location is important based on this kind of product that you're going to launch. So in this case, we're trying to do research for a new fitness device. We want to understand the current market and users' expectations and pain points. We want to understand some of the demographics before we jump into actually asking questions about the product. So I might ask Elaine some of her you know, key characteristics that describe her as a fitness enthusiast, and I might ask her her favorite brands, okay? Now, I want to ask her open-ended questions because I'm trying to dig in and understand her pain points, the motivations, and the influences, for example. If you remember back to that template, that template had areas for motivations and pain points and influences. So I'm trying to fill in that template. So I might ask Elaine, uh, how did you decide to wear the tracker? Are we doing it now? Yes. Um, okay, all right. How did I decide to wear the tracker? Um, it was during the early days of the pandemic. My okay. watch died. Mm. And at that point in time, I was using my app, you know, the Google Fit app to track steps and it wasn't, you know, really doing much of anything. Mm -hmm. So my watch dies and I thought, okay, well, it's an upgrade opportunity. Why don't I get something I can recharge so I never run out of battery and it's COVID times, I don't want to have anybody mm -hmm. touch my stuff. Mm -hmm. So I um, did a little shopping and then I decided to get the, the Fitbit Inspire. This was the original Fitbit Inspire. I do not get paid by Fitbit. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not a product endorsement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so did you hear how I asked her the open-ended question? And she answered it sort of naturally speaking. I never interrupted her. I like to give a little feedback, like you'll hear me say, mm hmm, mm hmm, just to kind of prompt and give people, make people feel comfortable that they can keep speaking. So that's a great example. Thank you, Elaine. That's a great example of asking an open ended question in a user research session. Let me ask her another one. I'll ask her a second question Did anything or anyone influence you when you were deciding to purchase the tracker? Um, it wasn't really anyone. I'm fairly um, cognizant of all the products that's in this area, having been in consumer health and wellness professionally before. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew the options. Um, I knew I, I, and I actually did my own research online. Um, I looked at different products. I looked at um, product reviews um, <clears throat> and I looked at really the pros and cons. Um, and features said, and what is the job that I'm trying to get this thing to do for me, mm -hmm. right? And that's really what led me to this because um, I need um, I need to tell time. So that's mm -hmm. really basic. And I want it to last forever. I don't want to have to charge it a lot. And I'm really cheap. So I didn't want to buy an Apple Watch or anything expensive. And mm -hmm. so, so my needs were kind of really, really basic. Um, and that's what led me to this. Okay, thank you. So you can hear she's describing uh, some of the things that motivated her or the influences and, and decisions that she went through to decide to buy the product. I was looking for, for example, whether she had an influence from, say, uh, a fitness coach who might have recommended that she buy the watch uh, or, the, or the tracker. So, um, so I think, you know, like some, something I just thought of is um, definitely Fitbit is something that everybody knows. But then mm -hmm. there are people close to me who wear the Fitbit. Mm -hmm. um, and I was aware of how many people were wearing fitness trackers and how many of those were Fitbits. So mm -hmm. that definitely just seeing it on other people's, you know, lives um, and, and that they were kind of consistently still using it, that that had an effect. Okay, thank you. I uh, think Sudhakar that gives- actually, Yeah, so Sudhakar actually has a question. Okay. How would you change the first question if you're trying to find out if Elaine may even be interested in fitness or fitness tracking in the first place? So I was uh, using a, an example where Elaine is actually a, a user of a fitness, uh, a fitness tracking device. So if I, if she was not interested in fitness. Know. Yeah, if you don't know. Yeah, if you don't know, I would, I would sort of reduce the focus on actually wearing the tracker and just dig for some uh, reasons why she might consider it, okay? So I might say to her, um, what are your thoughts about fitness and what are your goals? So kind of leave it open like that and let her describe right. what so she wants. Right, so that's the question, what are the goals of fitness? For me, it's really 
um, to get strong so you're good at the, the, the everyday living tasks. So I'm not trying to lose weight or build body mass or anything. I just want to kind of be flexible and stay strong and, and be able to kind of, for example, pop um, uh, a hand carry over, you know, over into the overhead compartment when we're flying again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you can see I'm starting to move through that template and I'm gonna also now, I've got a couple of questions on her usage and the task flows that she um, is employing typically in her use, use as a, um, a user of this device. So for example, I might ask her, can you walk me through an example of how you use the tracker? Um, absolutely. <clears throat> so I basically don't really take this off. Um, it's, uh, you know, you can swim with it. So I basically don't take it off. I'm wearing it until I uh, go out of battery and I'm wearing it everywhere. Um, each morning when I wake up, I open the Fitbit app and then I look at my sleep. That's the first thing I do every morning. Um, did I sleep well? Um, and why did I sleep well or not well? So last night, I did pretty well, you know, this is a reasonable amount of time asleep. And then I had a pretty restorable, uh, restorative sleep. Then I would go about doing stuff. So today I bike to work. I can prove it. I have, you know, I bike to work. So I would want to see if Fitbit knew that I bike to work and it did actually recognize my outdoor bike. Um, so that's great. I get credit for, you know, burning nine zero calories. That's not even one cookie. So that's sad. So I got to do something else. Um, and so uh, I might look at my uh, steps at the end of the day to see mm -hmm. how did I do there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if I did something strenuous, like if I knew I was walking all over campus and very hilly campus here, mm -hmm. uh, I would want to look at how did I do in terms of, you know, just that being recognized as a walk because I mm -hmm. want to get credit for every single step. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other uh, types of questions we might ask. We might ask about the benefits or the particular problems that she's getting solved with this device or a device that she might use. And also about something like pricing. I might ask like, how do you feel about the price? So these are questions. Again, these are open-ended questions. You can see I'm asking and then I'm not talking over her and I'm not trying to influence her answers. I'm letting her speak. I'm, by the way, taking very careful notes. If it's okay to record, I will be recording. I may have someone else with me. I'm usually when I'm asking the questions, it's called the moderator. <clears throat> it's good to have someone who's also observing. So you're doing this research in a team and you're able to gather this information by letting people speak, okay? Now, the closing is what I usually like to do to ask about whether or not this person would say recommend a particular product to a, a family member or a friend because that's a, called a net promoter score. I'm trying to get a sense of whether or not they would um, really value the product and why. And then I also like to ask if I'm developing a new product, I want to know, especially if this person's been a really good research subject, whether I can contact them in the future when we have a prototype. And generally people are very positive about it because they are interested in, in giving their opinion and feedback. I also show gratitude, really thanking people for their time. I write a nice thank you note, follow up note, and let them know how much you appreciate their inputs. And in some cases where appropriate, you can give them an honoraria, like a gift card to Amazon or something to just let them know how much you appreciate your time. Okay, so thank you, Elaine, that was great. And I, these are some recommendations on doing user experience research. Now, you're trying to get to that problem statement, right? So on the left, is a poor, sorry, on the left is a good problem statement for the fictitious device that we are thinking about designing for which we just interviewed Elaine. Consumers need a simple way to continuously monitor their activity and manage their health. On the right is a poor problem statement. What's wrong with the one on the right? It states the problem, it's, sorry, it states the solution, not the problem. It's too focused on stating the, solution without actually stating what the original problem is and proving that it's something that's impactful. So now if you look at what might look like the persona 
for Elaine after we completed our research, maybe we interviewed several others, we started to see trends in the results of our research sessions, and we're able to build this validated persona with actual feedback. So for example, she may have a goal that she wants to complete the Boston Marathon, she wants to stay in shape during the winters in Boston. And so we are using the research data to really uh, validate what we have proposed in our persona definition. So what not to do during the user interviews, don't ask leading questions. For example, don't lead them to an answer. Don't interrupt them, don't talk over them. Don't use the session as a sales opportunity that that's coming later. Maybe, you know, you, you really want to use this as for generative research. You want to understand users' needs and pain points, let them talk and don't get too quantitative too soon. So keep the early interviews qualitative. Opinions, feelings, expressions of their pain points. Quantitative stuff can come later on when you do more quantitative research. So you want to build up enough evidence to get to confidence in the data you're gathering. You wanna validate your core assumptions about your personas and you wanna look for consistency and patterns in the answers during the interviews. And you can stop when you have consistency in the data you're gathering. You don't have to answer, you know, you don't have to interview hundreds of people. Sometimes you can get enough data in three, four, five, six interviews, and then you have consistency in the data. But your personas should really be unique and not overlapping because you're really trying to design targeted solutions and uh, too much overlap in your personas is, is, makes the solution space very difficult. So you may see multiple users in your research and you wanna look for patterns. So their needs, for example, they, everybody could be telling you or a large proportion of the people are telling you they need legibility as a key requirement for them. They need the numbers to be legible or they have specific feature requests. You know, if they're telling you that they really need to understand what's going on with the battery, how long the battery life is, when the battery needs charging, that should be a really important signal to you to think about in terms of prioritizing your features. Okay, so the problem, what problem does your product solve? For whom and why it's important? That's what the problem statement is. So we're gonna take some time now. I'd like you to take your pen and paper and I'd like you to write out a draft problem statement we're going to use this format. We're going to use the persona. We're going to state the need and the compelling reason. And again, don't include the solution in your problem statement. So this is the exercise. Now, uh, if you don't have an example that you want to use, you can use one of the ones at the right. So like an asthma sufferer needing to understand local air quality, a car owners who need to find out where gas is located, or parents that need to find trustworthy childcare. And I'd like you to add your draft, if you're comfortable, you can add the draft problem statement into the chat, but go ahead and write them down. We'll review together and we'll give you feedback on the problem statements. So I'm gonna um, recap, just make sure you understand the what and the why. You need to clearly understand the problem statement. Don't include the solution in the problem statement and Really think about your product as enabling or optimizing a solution to a particular use case. The who, that persona definition, we, you wanna validate, you wanna first propose and then validate the persona, the user of your solution. Now you wanna validate each unique persona through these qualitative interviews and your solution may have more than one persona. And don't forget, you can have buyer personas or end user personas. A buyer persona is about a purchase transaction. So you may have different kinds of personas, but again, open-ended questions, don't try to sell and use the data that you gather in those interviews to prove or disprove your persona hypotheses. Okay, so do we have questions and do people wanna put their problem statements into the chat? Yes, 